I have a problem with sitting still. Films, however, have often provided me with stillness. When a movie is working emotionally, I can happily sit in an inner tube and let it float me down the narrative river. I think one of the next levels of still films is what I like to call low and slow cinema. If I was being unkind, they could also be called anti-Michael Bay films. Movies that are perhaps light on dialogue, light on quick edits, sometimes without a soundtrack telling you how to feel. For some, these types of films are a street that leads straight to boredomville. I don't think it's a moral or artistic failing to not be able to enjoy or interact with these type of films, but if you are inclined to watch movies that push your tastes and expectations of the very idea of what a film can be, then there's two low and slow films that I think might tickle your fancy. Let's start with the OG of slow and low filmmakers, Chantal Ackerman. Chantel had made experimental or avant-garde films as a student in Belgium. Chantel began as a student filmmaker making short films that were biographical in nature and as director Ira Sachs notes, she was interested in how bodies and places interacted with each other within the frame. There is a kind of boxed in nature. On the other hand, the shot is so wide. You're always seeing full body. So to me, there's also a lot of space in that room. It's a playground. It's a place of isolation, but it's also a place of freedom. This carries over into her first feature film, Jeanne Dalman, 23, Quart de Commerce, 1080 Bruxelles. Sorry, I murdered that probably. A film that is very much about how our protagonist is sort of trapped, but also master of her domain as a housewife in Belgium in the 1970s. Ackerman wanted to highlight the women that she saw around her growing up in Belgium, their sense of duty and quiet diligence they had with how they cooked and cleaned and took care of the house. C'est dans ma peau, quoi. J'ai fait ce film pour donner une existence cinématographique à ces gestes. Ackerman also had a 80% female crew, so you get the sense that this is a deeply personal and female-led portrayal of women. C'était important d'avoir une équipe à 80% de femmes. C'était très difficile, il y avait très peu, on ne faisait pas confiance au chef opératrice par exemple. C'était vraiment considéré comme un métier d'homme. Même les preneuses de son n'existaient quasiment pas. The film is told through static wide framing and extremely long takes, sometimes four or five minute long shots as Jeanne Delman goes through her mundane tasks and sees three separate clients as a sex worker. All of her interactions with her son, retail workers, even the men who visit her for her services are all small and simple and non-dramatic, but after the visit from the second client, something changes. There's no indication of anything particularly bad happening, but there's all these small moments that start to add up after a visit from the second man. Her closely kempt hair starts to loosen. She makes mistakes with her cooking, and all the while we can feel her isolation and her loneliness. There's no one else there with her, barely. It's just her and her son sometimes, and a baby she looks after occasionally. We've seen her make coffee, clean shoes, make small talk to her son numerous times for over three hours now, and it can all feel quite unremarkable. But by this time, we know how diligently she follows her routine. So when we start to see the mistakes, we can feel that something is deeply wrong. We are silent witnesses to her quiet desperation. Towards the end, there's a shot of her sitting in a chair, cloth in hand, staring at the floor. It's about three minutes long, and the framing of the well-kept house, the silence, the lack of movement and dialogue, for me, it's all really, unsettling. I don't want to give away the ending, but let's say it's definitely enhanced by this long, slow and still nature of the first three quarters of the film. The next film, I think, is a nice bridge between something that could be described as abstract and a more conventionally narrative-based film. Joanna Hogg's The Souvenir is a semi-autobiographical telling of her time as a student filmmaker and her relationship with a mysterious drug user. What's super interesting for an independent filmmaker is that she has this sort of trilogy giving Marvel a run for their money. She has The Souvenir Part 1, The Souvenir Part 2, which picks up at the end of Part 1, and the very bewitching The Eternal Daughter, the end game of the trilogy, so to speak. The Eternal Daughter is a step away from the kitchen sink drama of the souvenirs and it's a ghost story with Tilda Swinton playing the now middle-aged filmmaker character as well as playing her elderly mother. Anyway, back to Souvenir 1, Winter Soldier. While some scripts are followed pretty closely with minor changes made on the day and others like the Coen brothers are followed to every single sound and word in the script, 
There are a few filmmakers, say like Christopher Guest for instance, who create scenarios and rough shapes of scenes and let the actors improvise the dialogue. Joanna Hogg seems to follow something like this in her films. Quote, I'll design a setting for a scene and then the words come out of them because of the situation that they're in. And then we'll develop it over a number of takes. So the first take will often be very rough and quite chaotic. Sometimes I like that and that often goes in the cut. Or I'll get it sculpted so by take 11, everything is more streamlined. She also goes on to note that her scripts sometimes are almost like novels, outlining inner thoughts and details, things that are normally omitted from scripts, which are all about what we can see, not how characters feel. This gives the souvenir a really fresh, almost documentary feel. Conversations are sometimes stilted, crash into each other, or very little is said, but this all feels closer to how real life interactions occur. Overall, it just feels calmer and more realistic in its depiction of life. Can you swap the warm wine's heat <laughs> into this? Sure. I don't think it's clear about how we're meant to feel about the protagonist, Julie, a young filmmaker at university, or Anthony, the drug-taking man of mystery. I think in a less subtle film, we'd be forced to identify with Julie more as the protagonist, but the way this is presented feels closer to real life. Not everyone is a villain or a hero or a ragamuffin who learns the real meaning of friendship. Sometimes Julie is brave, sometimes she is scared, naive and frustrating. Sometimes Anthony is obnoxious, mysterious, brittle. The power of low and slow filmmaking really comes into play at the end of the film. It builds so beautifully with this fly on the wall sense of filmmaking. There's a lot of small moments, a handful of big dramatic moments, just like there are in real life. And finally we get the sense that she's found her confidence and found her voice as a filmmaker as she directs a scene and then, bang, what is that look? Is it a defiant, I've made it, I'm here? Is she acknowledging the audience? Is she thanking them for coming along the journey with her? Is she breaking the fourth wall after all this extremely naturalistic filmmaking? Whatever this look is to camera, it floored me. And I don't think it would have worked nearly as well if there wasn't this slow build up. There you have it. Let me know if you have any favorite low and slow movies in the comments below.